welcome to the Conversations on Healing podcast, where host Shay Bider speaks with renowned healthcare leaders, practitioners, and thought leaders to explore the world of wellness, the incredible powers of self-care, and what it truly means to heal today. Join us on this journey to become more whole, healed, and connected. Welcome, Tom, to the Conversations on Healing podcast. I'm delighted to be with you this morning. Thank you so much for having me, Shay. I'm really looking forward to it. Good, good. Um, So I wanted to start by talking a little bit about um, how you came up with the idea for the work that you're doing. So you did this really fascinating TED Talk called A New Way to Help Young People with Their Mental Health. And in it, you discuss the importance of mental health for young people, particularly in your community in Kenya. And I'd be interested for you to share with our listeners kind of what led you to doing this work. Thanks once again for having me, Shay. Um, You know, as you've mentioned, I was born and raised in in rural Kenya, um, a very small town um, in the southwest. Uh, so in my community, when, you, when you're when born, you are put into an age group. So this is a group of people who were born right around the same year or so. Um, and in my age group, um, we were about 12 kids um, and we started secondary school together. Sorry, um, we started kindergarten together, but you know, only two of us went to, to high school. Um, and I was the only one who um, ended up graduating from college. Um, so that's kind of like some background, uh, but kind of more, you know, concretely growing up, there was this immense and intense pressure to succeed. And, and the only way you could succeed and the only way you could make something out of yourself was through academics. So there's a lot of pressure on us to do well in school. And, and for me, you know, that meant going to public boarding school from a very early age. Um, and here in public boarding school, um, we, you know, like many people around the world, you know, we wake up very early in the morning, you know, um, they do a lot of like psychosocial pressure from family, from, you know, the school, et cetera, to succeed. Um, and most of the time when we were struggling with emotional, you know, behavioral, um, cognitive problems, you know, we just assumed that this was, you know, what it meant to grow up, what it meant to work out, what it meant to, you know, uh, what was the human experience. Um, and it wasn't until I was in college um, when I began realizing that, you know, perhaps all of these experiences that we had had, which seemed to be normal, um, could have in fact been you know, mental health problems. Mm-hmm. So that was the first realization um, that kind of drove me towards the work that we're doing at Shamiri. Um, so the second you know, thing is just the nature of Kenya and to a large extent, the African continent. So we're a very youthful continent. I think um, across the continent, the median age is 19. Mm. So we have way more people who are, you know, under 19 than who are over, you know, 19. Mm-hmm. At the same time, the opportunities for young people to lead meaningful lives has not, you know, increased with the population. So I can only imagine how much, you know, pressure there is now Uh, on young people to succeed um, um, in a context where there's so many young people. Um, And I think that is both the great gift and also the challenge of my generation, um, 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 which is like the very youthful population, which I think gives us an opportunity, you know, really take a next step, you know, um, as a society, but also have a great, you know, challenge to ensure that all of these young people can be able to actualize the life outcomes, can be able to flourish and, you know, live their lives to, to, to their fullest. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that actually is the core of the mission of the work that we're doing at Shamiri, which is to, you know, try and provide, you know, holistic tools to allow people to actualize, young people to actualize the life outcome. Right. And more specifically on mental health and well-being, you know, just because of this, experiences that I uh, had growing up and so many other young people in Kenya have. Yeah. So this combination of having a high percentage of young people within the country, 
And then what you noticed that many of your peers were really struggling with mental health issues like anxiety and depression and some of that coming from tremendous academic rigor in your case, because you're in this boarding school with a lot of intensity to try to succeed. Um, you started to identify, you know, kind of an interesting methodology for how to address this. And I want to talk about that because the approach that you've used is to create programs for young people that are led by young people. And so I'd like to talk about that because it's a very interesting approach to mental health. I know that you had mentioned on one of the talks that I listened to that um, in the entire country at one point in time, there were only two psychiatrists. I don't know if that's still accurate, but um, you know, given that you had to find other means because there was a not a tremendous number of um, uh, mental health professionals that would be available. So you used a very creative solution, which is to have young people helping other young people to alleviate some of the mental health challenges. So I'd like to, for you to speak a little bit to your model and why you've chosen to design it in the way that you have. Yes, I think that there are two things that make it difficult to think about mental health, quote unquote, traditional and by traditional, I mean how we you know, think about it, you know, seeing a psychiatrist, et cetera. And the first, uh, you know, as you rightfully mentioned, is the lack of, um, you know, caregivers. So in 2018, we had to think one child and adolescent psychiatrist in the whole of Kenya. Uh, last year, the number was two, you know, children and adolescent psychiatrists. Besides this, um, I think we have about one clinical psychologist for every one million people. So, so the traditional ways, you know, that we think about treating mental health through these caregivers, you know, is just not feasible in this context. And the second thing is uh, stigma and the history of mental health, and, and in particular, formal psychotherapy and psychiatry, you know, um, um, in this context. So when we start thinking about mental health, at least more formally in, in Kenya, it is during the British colonial rule. And we have asylums, you know, which also serve as, you know, very political tools, you know, where people are actually locked away from their families. Um, and so we introduce mental health as this thing where once you're diagnosed a mental health problem, you have to be physically removed from your society and taken and locked up in an asylum, you know, and when, when you come back, you're not a fully human, you know, complete human in the society. And obviously that lends people to not want to seek mental health or to be diagnosed, you know, kind of with mental health. And so when we were thinking about the work that we're doing in Shumiri, those were two of the biggest things that we had to deal with, the lack of expert um, and the stigma. Um, and we realized as we we're thinking about this, that because you have such a youthful population, mm -hmm. we also have this great opportunity to harness the, you know, energy and enthusiasm of young people as part of, you know, the caregiving force for mental health. So in Kenya, uh, after high school, everyone takes a one year gap year. So the government kind of mandates everyone to take one year between high school and college. And most of the time people are looking for things to do at that point. Um, and so we thought that that was a good age group for people who could go back to their communities um, and, 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 and help provide mental health services. With regards to stigma, uh, we realized that stigma had two components. The first was the context of, of mental health. And I mean by the context is the formal labeling. You know, so right now, if I was to go to a psychiatrist, they would diagnose me with a formal level of depression. And then I will also have a sick formal help, you know, either seeing a therapist in the office or taking a pres you know, medication, et cetera. And that context is stigmatizing. Um, and then the second thing is the content of um, mental health care. And most of the time, the content of mental health care dwells a lot with deficiencies and psychopathology. Um, and that also is stigmatizing. Um, and so to deal with this, you know, we 
just to confine to you this thing that we've all known around the world for a very long time, that rather than only deficiency in psychopathology, mental health also you know, refers to broader you know, flourishing, broader human functioning. Um, and so you can be able to, quote unquote, treat this deficiency in psychopathology by also just you know, strengthening you know, human flourishing, uh, strengthening human functioning, uh, et cetera. And some of the techniques that we can use to strengthen human flourishing, um, um, et cetera, are techniques that are very simple and are very human and that you can teach you know, high school graduates to effectively be able to deliver cost you know, um, effectively, yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. It's wonderful that you identified kind of a larger picture here where flourishing was an element that really needed to be addressed, that you were able to take in um, basically the scars from British colonial rule and how those have deeply impacted the way that people feel even able to consider receiving mental health services. And then, you know, you've created this very interesting solution. I've also heard you talk about how important it is to have the solutions to the challenges that we face be locally led. And, you know, obviously your organization is an example of that, where you identified a problem or a challenge in your community around mental health and a need for support and services. Um, but then you created a solution with that is locally led and that's involving, you know, young people in your community. And then you've also, I, I've heard you speak about, and yet you still need, in some cases, resources from, you know, the outside to provide maybe additional support to those locally led initiatives. So talk to me a little bit about why you think it's so important for these solutions to come from within, why this internal approach is so valuable. Yes, I think to begin with, um, often people confuse locally led solutions with, you know, just being fully, quote unquote, indigenous, you know, and, and, and in a way that, you know, people who are not from like a particular community cannot be involved. Um, so we, we don't think about it in that way, you know, we, we think at the beginning, mental health, human flourishing, there's a very human, you know, kind of um, things which, we all around the world experience and go through and the ways that we heal, you know, um, are to a lot of extent similar, you know, around the world because of, of our shared humanity. Um, and because of that, we do really try and really emphasize multicultural collaboration. One, because of, you know, this shared, you know, humanity and second, because it allows, you know, for cross-pollination of ideas and resources. Um, et cetera. But um, what we call for are two things. One is humility in, you know, being cognizant that mental health, well-being and healing, you know, even though global is very individualized and very localized, you know, we can, you know, for example, be practicing mindfulness, but how we practice it, even though we're doing the same thing, you know, can be quite localized and can be quite, you know, individualized. And so we should allow for that, you know, and create breathing, you know, space, you know, for that. Um, and then the second thing, and I think maybe for 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 my perspective, one of the most important is buy-in. You know, you need to get the buy-in of the communities that you're working with. And that buying also leads to sustainability. So we think about it from the perspective of buying and from the perspective of sustainability. And that is where localized solutions, you know, make a lot of sense, you know. Um, it's easier for me to get buy-in from other young people because we have this, you know, similar shared experience, I understand this context. You know, I am more committed to the course in Kenya because that's my home, that's where I come from. So I'm going to be in this, you know, kind of like for, for you know, for the long, uh, you know, for the long run. And then also, finally, it's just, when we all think about the history, basically even the experience of, of mental health, traditionally it's um, an experience in which we are othered and, 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 and uh, you know, we are othered from our society, we are othered from our communities. Um, and so when you don't have a local solution, 
it to some extent extends this other narrative because it's solution by, by others for your community, um, um, et cetera. Uh, and often this is very you know, powerful. So for example, depression, you know, depression is a universal um, uh, experience. But in my tribal language, we don't have a direct translation or what or concept for depression. So if I come in, you know, and I'm like, you know, I went, you know, to Harvard, I studied this DSM-5 depression. So I'm going to diagnose you with depression and I'm going to, you know, treat you for depression. That isn't going to work. You know, people are going to be like, oh, look at you, you think you're better than us, think you know more than us, et cetera, et cetera. And they don't even really connect with, you know, this um, level of depression. Uh, what we have found is because what we think of body depression is very global in my community and in many of the communities that we work with, there are local idioms of, the, of, of depression, the local ways that they experience stress and the stress, you know, kind of about depression. And so if you are going to think about delivering an intervention for depression, where the local solution comes in really importantly is it allows you to be able to bridge this gap, right? So maybe say you've discovered this great cure for depression, but if you come to Kenya and are curing people for depression, you know, that's the first roadblock. But my local, you know, context and local understanding can allow me to adapt, you know, this great idea that you have to this local context and make it work within this localized context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's very interesting um, that this idea in your work, um, not only of the localization, but then when we look at this idea of flourishing and well-being, and that that's something that could be taught, you know, by uh, young people in the community. It, it reminds me quite a bit of um, Traby and Shorter's work on asset framing. Um, which you might be well aware of, but for some of our listeners, the idea of asset framing, it's a, a narrative model that defines people by their assets and aspirations before noting their challenges and deficits. So it's kind of a, a way to frame things by starting with your assets and kind of leading with that before you move into the challenges. And what I'm hearing in your work, Tom, is... Um, this capacity for looking at the assets within your community and letting that kind of take some of the lead in the way that you're um, developing the work and noticing what you do have already in place that has the capacity to address some of these issues. So I'm curious what your thoughts are around that idea of asset framing. Yeah, I think that that you know, hundred percent is is what we are doing. Not only you know at the macro level when we are thinking about designing and implementing the intervention, but also the micro level when we are, when we when we are designing the interventions themselves. You know, um, for example, in in our interventions, we work with young people to you know help them notice you know um, the good things in their life, notice their values, notice you know the, the assets that they have, and. We use it as a point of, of departure for, for, for the rest of the conversations that you know that, that, that they are having, you know, kind of with them. So so a hundred percent, you know, um, the, the idea of uh, asset framing, you know, does really inform our approach to intervention development and, and implementation, but also, you know, kind of at a structural level, you know, those closest to the problem are closest to the solution. And and one of the reasons why this is is because they have, you know, this um assets that are often not salient, you know, people, because they are experiencing the, the, the challenges, often the salients are not as manifest. And so if you can make them, you know, more like, you know, salient and manifest, you know, it, 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 it begins to help you see all of these opportunities, you know, to, 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 to build something beginning from our strengths. Mm -hmm. um, um, and that I think even gives people you know, just like the sense of not only just self-worth, but also just, just the internal resources, you know, to be able to just mobilize and deal with, you know, the deficits because they understand what, what they have, what the assets are. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, Tom, if you have a story or two um, that's just a direct, you know, story from the young people you work with and how 
someone in your program has received services and what their outcomes and benefits may have been. Great. So I think I'll talk about this in two levels. One is just like an aggregate level um, and, um, and then a few uh, um, examples, you know, obviously, you know, because of confidentiality, you know, um, we can't reveal a lot of information, but I think at um, an aggregate level, so how our programming works right now is we train um, 18 to 22 year old high school graduates um, on what we call, you know, character strength interventions. So, you know, the interventions that, you know, are geared towards making, you know, more salient, you know, um, positive qualities about people, you know, the, the strengths that they have um, and, and teaching them strategies to use these strengths to navigate, you know, difficulties um, in life, you know, kind of or problem solve. As training is pretty brief, you know, it takes between 10 to 20 hours. Um, there are some didactics, but most of it is role play, you know, where they learn how to lead sessions and answer questions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so then after the training, uh, we work uh, with school in schools where we implement this as an after school program. So students gather in groups of eight to 15 other students, and one of our I call them Thrive Fellows, um, these 18, 22 year old lay providers. They lead these sessions. Um, so they, you know, it's mostly reading, writing, group discussion exercises uh, between sessions. There's normally homework um, that we ask the students to do. Um, so that's the nuts and bolt of, of, of the programming. So we, we've done a few um, clinical trials um, of, of the effects of this um, intervention. Um, looking at three, you know, buckets of outcomes. So the first bucket um, are mental health outcomes. So just looking at depression and anxiety, which are the two most common. Um, and what we have found is, you know, that compared to um, a control group, um, students who receive um, or go through this, this intervention report significant reductions in, in depression and anxiety that are comparable um, to those from multi-session one-on-one -on -one psychotherapy. Um, and in our longitudinal studies, we found this, you know, effects from just um, four sessions, four group-based sessions of, of, of our work last, you know, um, for up to like eight months post the, the intervention. Um, the second bucket that we've looked at um, are, um, academic um, and um, uh, socioeconomic outcomes. This is quite important, you know, from a buy-in perspective because, you know, we need to get the buy-in of teachers, parents, et cetera, to work in school. And, and, and they, um, fortunately, unfortunately, depending on who you ask, you know, care, you know, kind of about academic performance, school climate, et cetera. So we've, you know, um, looked as well at, at this bucket um, and we found um, that for, um, about 40% of students in um, our programming, they normally, you know, see between a one to 2% improvement in the academic grades in the, in the upcoming semester. Um, and then finally, we'll just look at, you know, things like, you know, gratitude and self-esteem, optimism, um, um, et cetera. And kind of in totality at the aggregate level, uh, what this research is showing is, you know, this, you know, positively focused, you know, asset focused character strength interventions delivered by young people, you know, can be as effective as um, psychotherapy, for example, given by, you know, clinical psychologists, um, while, you know, being really cost effective um, at, at kind of a fractional of cost. Um, so that's at an aggregate level. Um, one of the students, you know, in a program programming. So most of the time we work in um, public schools uh, in urban slums, because that's where it's a lot of like need. Uh, but one of the students we worked with um, in um, 2018 and um, um, part of our programming, we've been very lucky because now you know, it's been four years. So we're able to, you know, um, follow them um, across, across four years. But one of the things that has happened is, you know, they've been able to you know, graduate high school, go to university now. And I think for us, the important thing is they've now, they're now a fellow. So they are now part of this pipeline of other young people who are going back to their communities to, to lead these this, this sessions. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. 
So you've developed a way too that then once people go through your program, they can return and support and help others as well. Exactly, and it's also and also provides them an opportunity for meaningful employment because we because we they don't do this on a volunteer basis like they, you know, are able to make uh, be meaningfully employed um, um, while you know doing this. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. I'm I'm interested to hear how you think um, it's such a massive topic, but how you feel institutionalized racism is impacting the delivery of your programs, the success of your programs? Like, um, I know that's an enormous question, but I'm still interested to hear some of your thoughts about how the history of, you know, British colonial rule and the legacy of all the damage that that has left behind, um, you know, various uh, areas of impact where you still really see um, the remains of the day from that. So interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, this is, this is an, uh, as you mentioned, a really interesting topic. And I think for me, uh, as someone who also, you know, went to school in the US um, and, and lived in the US for, for, for a, a couple of years, it is, it's been interesting, you know, sometimes just um, exploring the dichotomy of, of the effect of, of, of racism on, on, on mental health in, in, in Kenya and in the US. So for example, in my experience in the US, you know, uh, racism uh, um, does affect, you know, for example, the kind of providers that people see, you know, whether they're able to afford it um, on outcomes, et cetera. You know, whereas in, in Kenya, um, the effect is is then substantial, but but it's it's, it's different in that um, it affects the it, it it affects because to a lot of extent you know Kenya is 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 gradually you know kind of homogeneous. So if you look at the outcomes of for mental health, you know, from a racial perspective, it's pretty much homogeneous. But whether the racism affects um, are is on the quality. Um, of, of mental health and of access to therapy. So what I mean by this is we unfortunately um, have embraced, um, and I think we're starting to move away from it, but we've, we've embraced a very, you know, Western-centric approach to mental health. You know, the when the diagnosis, for example, the DSM diagnosis of depression, anxiety, etc. These diagnoses, you know, when they're developed, they're not developed um, um, for black folks in the U.S., let alone, you know, um, African kids in, in Kenya, you know, but we've exported this, you know, uh, labels around the world, and we are now labeling, you know, we're labeling kids in Kenya with labels that were built, validated in, in a context that didn't really, you know, think about them think about the environment um, as well and then we're also trying to treat them you know with psychotherapeutic approaches which were also you know developed and tested in the west and you know just you know um, um, exported to kenya but allegedly this is the gold standard so you know when people are taught clinical psychology psychiatry this is the model you know um that that they are taught right um and so how this manifests is, for example, you know, if I get uh, diagnosed with depression in my uh, local, you know, village, uh, in my tribe, I first of all have to <laughs> grab my mind about what that means. Like, what does it mean, you know, kind of like to 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 depress to be depressed? What's the prognosis of that tribe? Uh, um, um, and then if you put into consideration the you know history of colonialism and the Salem system and you know that school of thought in psychiatry which was dominant for hundreds for hundreds of years you know we we're already starting from you know kind of like a, a bad place and then if even if I was going to now get therapy the quality is pretty bad because I am going through a therapy that has not been tested or tried you know, kind of like with folk like, like myself. So, so, so that is kind of the challenge that we, we are facing. And we need a movement to, to think about decolonizing. Um, and when I think, when, when I talk about decolonizing, colonizing how we think about mental and how we think about, you know, kind of sketches. So one thing 
that whenever I talk to folks, you know, um, in the West, America, they're like, oh, wow, like, how do you deal with stigma on mental health? And I'm like, actually, mental health is not stigmatized. And they're like, shocked. Like, what do you mean by mental health stigmatized? And I'm like, okay, if I diagnose someone with depression, that is stigmatized. You know, but if we talk about, you know, trouble sleeping, you know, um, trouble eating, you know, lack of motivation, these are things that are not stigmatized that we had our own, you know, indigenous methods of care and methods of healing and Right now, people still get healing for, you know, um, and, and talk, you know, um, more openly about than they do, you know, kind of about the formal label of um, depression, um, 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 et cetera. So, yeah, so, so I think at a high level, that is, for me, one of the most distinct differences between the effect of, of, of racism and mental health in the Kenyan context vis-a-vis, for example, the, the American context. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you raised several important ideas there, but one being this idea that there's a colonizing of ideas, right? There's a colonizing of ideas and kind of a spreading of those ideas internationally that may really not have a lot of relevance to an individual culture or group of people. And so um, I think that's a very important point that you're making. Um, about how ideas themselves can have a colonialism embedded in in them and in the distribution of those ideas and that there are uh, many different ways to approach this from within the community itself that might look very different. And that idea you said where, yes, depression might seem stigmatizing within your community, but that all of these other ways of looking at it or talking about it, like regarding sleep, et cetera, might not carry that stigma. So obviously that requires a sensitivity and a local understanding to be able to reach that. Um, I want to ask you a little bit, Tom, about sort of this idea of, you know, holistic functioning and social relationships being really critical to mental health, because I know that that is something that you value. So I want to hear you, um, share a little bit about how you see holistic functioning and social relationships really being key to the way your work is being administered. Yeah, so uh, one of the ways we think about mental health and it's starting to become a little bit mainstream in the um, psychological literature as well, is that rather than think about a mental health problem like let's say depression, as um, a disease with um, an underlying cause, um, et cetera, uh, we start to think about the depression as symptoms, you know, um, that um, interact with each other, um, almost in, in, in a network. So another way I like to explain to this is, people do this is like a social networks, friend networks, right? So. Let's say um, I am f- friends with you, Shay. Um, so that is, you know, we have a, a, a knot that connects us. Um, but you also have other people who you are friends with. Um, and I also have other people that I am friends with. Um, and yeah, and, and those can continue, et cetera, et cetera. And so using that analogy, let's say my friend group is the psychopathology friend group, right? So that's the friend group where one of my friends is trouble sleeping, you know, the other one is lack of motivation, etc. cetera. Um, and you have a friend group where it's maybe happiness and optimism and, you know, motivate, you know, motivation and social relationships, etc. cetera. Um, and so using this analogy for mental health, you know, we think that, a challenge is we have been spending way too much time on the psychopathology friend zone and not in other, you know, kind of friend zones. Um, and so the idea is if let's say I go to your friend group and I realize that, okay, so Shay has a connection to Tom. So maybe if I want to influence Tom on his friend group, what I can do is I can target Shay and, you know, be like, okay, Shay, go and talk to Tom and then Tom can talk to his friend group, right? So um, I can, you know, be like, okay, let us improve 
uh, say social happiness and maybe the social happiness is going to you know talk to the other friends who are you know leading to the depressed mood etc cetera, etc cetera. um and so we've been trying to do things like that and the ways that you can statistically model uh these networks and so in kenya one of the things we've done uh, in uh, with adolescent uh, populations is we've uh, we've built networks, you know, for depression, anxiety. We build networks for this, what we call this positive psychological well-being things like, you know, happiness, optimism, gratitude, etc. We've built networks for social relationships, you know, social support, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And actually, the thing that we have found is the most um, important relationship between the so-called psychopathology network and, and, and any of the other network is the uh, social support, you know, um, uh, node or person in the that network, and more specifically, you know, um, significant other of family-based social support. So we found the biggest indicator of, um, um, uh, was whether students felt that they could get emotional help and support from the family and loved ones was really important. And so if you could improve that, so if you could improve children getting emotional help and support, you could reduce things like self-blame. Um, you know, you could do self-blame, you could um, reduce, you know, irritability, depressed mood, et cetera, without necessarily having to deal with you know any of these things, and so that allows us in this context to be able to to circumvent stigma, because you know we are not trying to be like okay, tell me you're depressed, tell me you're self blaming, etc. We're like okay, how can we improve your happiness, or how can we improve your you know relationships with the people that you love and that you care about. Um, and what we, what we have found is that is an easier sell and that gets people much more excited, you know, that you then telling them, okay, we think you self-blame yourself. And so we're going to try to help you not self-blame. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Looking at it from a, a more positive perspective, which it's really interesting because um, you've probably seen like the Framingham study, which is this like huge longitudinal study that's been conducted over many, many years. And they've taken that data set and looked at happiness within social networks. And it's actually quite clear that if you have someone within your social network that's happy, that's like a direct friend, it increases your happiness. And they've even identified it within this social network quantitatively. So it increases your happiness by 15%. And if this friend of mine who's happy has another friend that I haven't even met that is happy, then that their happiness increases my happiness by 10% and it keeps going from there. Yeah. So, you know, so we know that this is true, right? We're seeing it in large social networks where they're starting to, to study it and to try to understand how happiness impacts entire social networks. Um, and it sounds like what you're drawing upon in your work is fundamentally, you know, a humanistic understanding of that, that, there's ways that we can approach well-being that are looking at the creation of networks that, you know, in, inspire in a sense um, happiness by surrounding yourselves with other people that are happy and creating these connections um, dynamically. And I think there's a tremendous amount that we can learn um, about that. So I'm happy to hear. Yeah, you. And, and, mm -hmm. and it also just makes a lot of sense, you know, kind of intuitively, you know, because you know, across the world, you know, one of the things, regardless of like the culture and the society, you know, community is, is, is a constant. It's something that, you know, um, we all globally, you know, kind of like value. And so there has to be a reason why, we, you know, we genetically evolved to, you know, um, value community and, 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 and social support and, and, and family and friendship, yeah. And I think that's another very important part of your work to highlight, Tom, is that a lot of Western approaches to illness, right, or dis-ease, like we're discussing, are very one-on-one. -on -one. We have a lot of kind of one-on-one -on -one solutions um, in our framing and in the way we handle diagnostics and treatment. 
Whereas a lot of the types of modeling that you're discussing, and also actually in the work that I do, the solutions are very community-based. So it's not so individuated. It's more looking at how you create impact across communities and through communities and how there can be community-based solutions rather than kind of individuated solutions. Um, and so that element of your work also seems extremely powerful because it's another way of looking at it, right? How we get to places of change through community. Yeah, and 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 and, and actually it's really interesting because you know one of the uh, one one of one reason study found that one of the you know significant determinant of, of whether interventions are, are successful is this idea of sense of belonging. You know, do you belong in a space? Do you belong in a community, etc. Um, and um, which at least for me sometimes is is funny because as you've mentioned, most traditional, you know, mental health is is one on one, and um, it doesn't really foster, you know, kind of that sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I personally think group based ways are the way to go, you know, uh, the most effective intervention in the world, alcoholic anonymous is a group based, you know, kind of peers communities, you know, system that doesn't really need experts to and it is and is mostly, you know, kind of like self you know, self run, self running, you know, um, and so uh, I think group based approaches are effective. And, you know, we have a lot of evidence for that, not just from our work, but I'm sure also from your work and people in, in South Asia and West Africa, uh, who are, you know, Latin America showing that this group based approach mm -hmm. works, and it's also more scalable and, and, and accessible and, and allows us to multiply ourselves in ways that we cannot be able to do by seeing people one-on-one. -on -one. Right, right, right. Yeah, it was very interesting to me. We had a, um, a, a PhD candidate do their doctoral dissertation on our retreat program. And that's like a large scale community-based program. And it involves families who have children with a variety of different health issues, everything from cancers to genetic conditions and a number of different um, kind of challenges. And when this uh, research was conducted and they asked the families, like, what was the most important thing to you from going through this community-based healing retreat intervention, essentially? Like, what did you, what was the key takeaway? The most common thing that the family said was a sense of belonging, that for the first yeah. time, they really felt like they belonged, that they weren't isolated and alone. And that knowing that they had a community and that they you know, now had friends and a network that they could turn to who understood some of the challenges that they were facing was incredibly meaningful to them. So I think yeah, and, and, we can't yeah. underestimate the importance of that, right? And I think we have, and especially, you know, we, we live in very highly individualized societies, you know, um, I think almost globally right now. And, and um, uh, the new technologies that make it further, further, you know, like highly, you know, kind of individualized. And so, um, and, and we are forgetting this resource, you know, of community. And um, um, that is really powerful. And, and I think gives you not only just a sense of belonging, but, you know, just also some like meaning, you know, you want to see your community and engage with them and you know and, and do things and do things with, with your community so yes i think i couldn't um agree more with 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 this and, and just encouraging people to um continue you know seeking communities and also just building community-based group-based you know kind of like healing interventions and and, and methods yeah so Tom, I like to ask all of our guests how they would uh, describe or define what healing is, but I know that you've shared with me that you kind of, you know, shy away from defining healing for the people you work with because you want them to define that for themselves, you know, which makes so much sense to me. So I would ask you then perhaps how you personally would define what healing is. Yeah, so... Uh... You know, one of the, uh, I'm going to, so I'm just regressing a little bit, but coming back to that is, 
you know, one one of the things or philosophies or ideas that are really influenced to think about a lot of things and and you know, kind of more specifically healing is this uh, literature on aesthetics. You know, um, for a long time, humans, philosophers, thinkers were obsessed by you know what is beautiful, what is aesthetically pleasing, and um, um, yeah, and, and and then in the 18th century, uh, there was this German philosopher called Patrick Schiller, who suggested that uh, rather than you know, kind of basically what he suggested that you know what was beautiful and what was aesthetically pleasing was not something that we could define, but rather the process of arriving, you know, kind of at that thing, you know. Uh, and so art, for example, is not in its definition, you know, the finished work or the thing that you see, you know, um, in the museum, um, but it is, you know, kind of like the process of making something. And so because of that, all of us can be artists because all of us can create and, you know, make decisions and be autonomous, etc. cetera. Um, and, I think often one of the reasons I was bringing this is one of the, 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 the things I first thought when I'm having this conversation um, is people expect healing to, you know, be uh, a destination to be like, you know, this great photograph or this great thing that when you see, you're like, you know, I'm healed. You know, that is it. That is what, 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 what healing means. Um, but I think for me, I try to think about it from, from a process, you know, narrative from a process lens. And how I think about it is from, you know, quote unquote extreme base, baselines or places, you know, where, you know, we may be dealing with, with trauma or we may be dealing with a mental health problem or this, you know, kind of something that has triggered or happened to us to just, you know, daily going through life and, you know, just being human, you know, we are constantly in this process of healing. Um, though I think we often tend to think about it, we have to come from a baseline where I have to be, you know, for example, healing from the trauma of the experience that I had in high school. Um, or I have to be healing from uh, maybe a diagnosis of depression. Um, and so I am actively in this thinking, going through this process of you know, being cognizant of this and trying to seek cures or remedies, you know, the way we think about it more traditionally and medically, you know, to arrive at, um, uh, at, 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 at healing. And I think, yes, that is a subset of healing and um, a very valid definition. But I think it's a very narrow definition and a narrow scope of, of, of thinking uh, um, 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 about healing, you know, because I think every day the stimuli and just experiences of just being human leave some sort of indelible meaning in our lives. And as we make meaning of what this is for positive or negative or no neutral, you know, I think in that process we are healing, you know, um, and healing doesn't have to arrive from uh, something happening to you, so a deficit that you're trying, you know, kind of like to, 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 to be whole. Um, I think it's just the process of finding meaning um, of what it means to be human. I think that's something that we are all grappling with, you know, um, 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 and we'll always grapple with. Um, and as we do that, you know, even if we, as we are going, we're going while we are making this podcast and as people are listening to this podcast, you know, there is a mark that it leaves. Um, and as we process this, I think that process for me is, is what healing is. Mm -hmm. That's a, a yeah. wonderful description, Tom. Um, well, as we start to uh, think about bringing our conversation to a close. One of the ideas I want to pick up on that you spoke about today that I think is an important one to kind of leave in the minds of our listeners is this idea that 
perhaps a way that we could look at something like, for example, depression is that it perhaps could be seen as a functional response to a community challenge. <laughs> so that community challenge could be within the family, it could be within the broader community, it could be within the context of, um, in your case, maybe an academic system or the way a school is designed. So there are a number of possible layers there in terms of um, that sort of external or environmental condition that is helping to contribute to an experience of depression. But there is a, a lens through which we can see this, that is, it is actually a functional response to external conditions in the environment, in the community that are not helpful to that individual, that are not optimal to that individual, that in some way are creating a dampening down of that individual. And I think this idea, you know, that you're pointing us towards, and obviously I'm putting it kind of in my own words here, but um, is a very important idea, right? Because it, as we've discussed in Western systems, we often look a lot from the individual perspective as if depression lives inside of you. But there are other ways to look at that where depression lives within communities. Depression lives you know, more broadly than within a single individual. Um, it can actually be within networks of individuals. So um, as we kind of uh, wrap up our dialogue, I just wanna, give you a moment to speak to that kind of the community-based perspective of, of mental health in whatever way you would like to. Yeah, I think uh, I will be you know, remiss to, you know, talk about this without mentioning um, some really great work that, that was done in, in this field in the last um, century. So in the 1950s um, in Nigeria, we had this, guy called Thomas Lambo. So he was a Nigerian guy, um, got a scholarship um, from the British government and moved to, um, I think it was Birmingham, to study medicine and psychiatry. So he, in theory, you know, is the first like, you know, Western trained psychiatry in Africa. So he moves, so first of all, so, so he goes, he moves to Birmingham and he is um, exposed to, you know, what you're saying, which is this very individualistic lens of thinking about, you know, mental health, you know, where everything is stemming, at least from us, when we think about it, from these two models. So one from a psychological model, it is stemming from thoughts, you know, so you as an individual have you know, thoughts which, you know, are devious or misaligned or not, you know, so we have to work with you as an individual to figure out those thoughts. Um, and if you go to the psychiatrist, they're like, okay, there is something in your brain chemically or biologically, which is not wired right, you know, so we're going to give you this medication, you know, to kind of like rewire your brain so you can wire it, you know, kind of like right. Um, and so for him, that didn't make sense. Um, for two reasons. One, you know, he having grown up in, in Nigeria, he had seen people who now he will diagnose as, you know, having mental health problems, you know, who got healing through community rituals, right? So you'd have someone who was clinically depressed, you know, will come to like the town square, the whole community will come and they'd have a ritual, like a healing ritual. And the person will go through this healing ritual and will go back to the community and will be, you know, um, at least, uh, I would say, it, elevated from this, you know, kind of problem. Um, and then the second was just also a more practical question was that how was he, as one psychiatrist, going to individually meet with everyone who's having a mental health problem in Nigeria, you know, figure out whatever cognitive problems they have or prescribe them, you know, all, 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 all medication? Um, and so what they did, um, which was quite phenomenal, is he built, um, I think it was shut down when he died, but it's called the Arrow Village Hospital, where he turned his whole community 
into uh, uh, um, a hospital, you know, and so the um, um, and so basically everyone was part of the healing process because you know we are not we are not like we are social beings and unlike for example more traditional diseases like COVID-19 which comes from a very specific pathology from a very specific you know kind of virus that is not the same with mental health problems it's not coming from a very specific you know miswiring of your brain or a mis or, or a misthinking that you have and so we forget about this community I think that is like the sad thing about the western model of mental health um, is it has forgotten that as you said the individual is a product of the community um, and even with the best psychiatric medication or one-on-one -on -one psychotherapy the individual has to still interface with the community um, and maybe that is one of the reasons why the effectiveness of most of this um, um, psychotherapies is pretty bad you know on, on average because the focusing on one dimension so deeply and forgetting um, the other and so what we think is the african um, and when you know the global south contribution to 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 mental health and healing is this call to think about the community um and we're not saying it's an either or i think there's a we need to work with everyone you know we need to work with healers however defined you know from traditional healers and shamans to you know clergymen and you know counselors you know we need to work with with with, with people but we also need to work with the community um and we need to move away from silos where those of us who are dealing with community mental health work together, you know, people doing one-on-one, -on -one, work together, but we never talk. So we need to move away from the silos and find ways of building communities of, of care um, that are all inclusive and encompassing of various approaches and traditions to, to healing. Mm -hmm. uh, well said, Tom. I, I love that idea of building communities of care that are inclusive of all of the different members of the community and um, that idea that you spoke to it that everyone is part of the healing community what a lovely approach to health and wellness if everyone is part of the healing community it's a beautiful way to look at it um, well I want to give you an opportunity if there's any last thoughts that you would like to share with our listeners I feel like you've enriched us with so many wonderful ideas today, but I'll open it up to you in closing. Hey, thank you so much, um, Shay, for having me. Um, and I think this podcast is, is you know, a great way of, of building, you know, these communities that, that we're talking about and that we need. So um, I'm just really happy to be here. I think finally, um, I'm just going to encourage um, our listeners to um, also seek, find, and help build their communities um, 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 of, of care and their communities of healing. Um, and, you know, I'm sure there may be ways, you know, um, on in person, virtually, of finding a community, you know, kind of like to belong with uh, and to belong to and to, and I think one of the things that our work, for example, has shown us, is that little and small things, you know, can be quite impactful. Um, and I'll just encourage us to seek ways to uh, find this meaning for ourselves, find these communities for ourselves, um, and turn, you know, ideas into action. Because I think we are starting to have these great ideas about how to do this. We need to find ways of turning this into action, however small or large. Thank you so much for having me, Shay. And really glad to have been part of this conversation on healing. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that, Tom. It's really been a pleasure. So thank you so much for your time today. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Conversations on Healing podcast. If you haven't yet, please go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast platform and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. It helps so you won't miss an episode. See you next time.